I think all of you know the history of Prabhupada, that he's traveled all over the world and done so much preaching. Fourteen times he traveled everywhere. And he departed in November, November 14, 1977. It was, uh, you can say for a disciple, the worst day in the life to see Guru Maharaj no more in this world. But uh, all of us at that time, in 1977, when Prabhupada, we found out Prabhupada had departed. So we just had to push forward. We were all young men and women at that time. And uh, Prabhupada left us a storehouse of transcendental knowledge. So all of you are learning in the university or college or university, it's college or university, college you call? College? Yeah, so all of you are gaining some knowledge, some information in the college or the university that you're um, involved with. But generally speaking, we have to be honest and say that the knowledge that one gets in these universities, it is mundane knowledge. It is not transcendental knowledge, generally speaking. You understand? Transcendental knowledge means on the spiritual level. But in the time that we live in, in these days, uh, the knowledge that people are getting in mostly the three things engineering medical and uh, IT those are very popular subject matters so those things they have some value we don't criticize that these colleges and universities uh, are, are bad we don't say they're bad they, they will give you some information that information, if you become good at practicing the things that you learn there. So you can earn some money from either your own company you can make or you can also, uh, you can go to work for some company. But we have to be realistic. That information, that knowledge is a topic that is on a mundane level, whereas in Krishna consciousness we are interested in loving Krishna. We are meant to love Krishna. You all read Bhagavad Gita some? In Bhagavad Gita chapter 4, text 35, there's a very short <coughs> sentence, only seven words long. It's in the purport. And Prabhupada says, we are all meant to satisfy Krishna. Seven words. We are all meant to satisfy Krishna. So, we are all eternal souls. Not one of you in the room, myself included, none of us will ever die. Because we are Jivatma. We are spiritual entities. So, there is no concern on that level. There is no beginning or end to the jiva. We are particles of Krishna. We are part and parcel of Krishna. And we belong to Krishna. In text 34, Krishna uh, is told, tells Arjuna that you should approach a spiritual master. You should inquire from him submissively and render service unto him. The self-realized soul will impart knowledge unto you because he has seen the truth. So you, all, you probably know that sloka 435. It's a common sloka. In the next verse it says that, And when one knows the truth, he will know that all living beings are a part of me, they are in me, and Krishna says they are mine. The living entities belong to Krishna. So we are Jivatma. We are very small spiritual sparks. And we belong to Krishna. I know we all have family members. I also have family members like everybody else. But these family members, we only 
spend time with one another for a few years because separation will come. How can you stop it? The time process is going on and within families one family member will depart this world. Maybe some accident. Maybe they were badly hurt and body was no longer usable because of some car crash. So that jiva will go to some other situation, some other, likely they will take a birth in some other situation. So in family members, uh, we're, we all have relationships with our family members, but those relationships are just for a short time because we will all be pulled apart. We will all be separated. I always think of it like taking trains. All of you must be taking trains from time to time. It's a common thing in India. So many trains are available. So my wife and I travel all over India and we go by train. And when we sit down, we talk to people. We usually stay at, in 2A compartments, in our age, bodily age, this is body is 70 years old. So we like to be in a, a situation where there are mature people there, not so many children running around crying and screaming on the train. We a little more quietude on the train is more pleasant. So we, we talk with people regularly. Sometimes we play harmonium on the train when we're going down the railroad track. We also play harmonium, we sing. So while we're on the train, we're talking. A person across from us or on the side, side, one side there, there's two people either lower or upper bunk. And generally there's four people here. So you can say there's six people in that cabin. So we're talking, talking to them. They're talking to us. After a short time, few, a few, uh, it can be a, a few hours one of those six people and they're, they're looking they're saying oh yeah I have to get down so the train starts slowing down and one of the people we were talking to we had a nice chat we spoke each other we told each other's names we told about our life what we do and then someone will say oh I have to go now okay then I'll say thank you nice to meet you very nice maybe we'll see you again so that person will go down on the platform and go do his business so we won't, likelihood, we'll, we won't ever see him again. We met them and then we no longer have any contact with them. And the same thing happens all the way down the, the line on the railway. Because sometimes we take from Udupi, we go to Delhi. That's 35 hours on a train. So the train stops many times and the people we speak to, we, we remember them, they remember us. So. We get separated from these friends. They are friends for a very short time and then we lose contact. So in the same way that people on a train meet and then separate, our family members meet and then what happens? We get separated. Is it a reality or not? It is, isn't it? There's nothing you can do to stop that. You cannot make any kind of arrangement that your family members can live for 10,000 years. This is Kali Yuga. You cannot do it in Kali Yuga. You cannot stay with your family members for 10,000 years or 1,000 years. You cannot. Just for maximum 100 years, basically. So, we have to uh, understand that we all belong to Krishna and we are all meant to satisfy Krishna. Jivas are not meant to gratify their senses. As Jivatmas, we are having loving feelings toward Krishna and we want to please Krishna's senses. Not that we want to please, in, uh, please our own senses. In college, I think we all are aware, the boys and girls nowadays, young men, young women. I know we live in Udupi. Anyone been to Udupi? Anyone know? Hmm? So, we live in Udupi and only seven kilometers away is Manipal University. So in Manipal University, they're coming from so many different cities, especially big cities. And Manipal University is a little costly. It's not inexpensive. It's costly to go to a university like that. They have to pay a lot of money. So the parents generally 
seldom come. Sometimes they, they don't come at all. They just wait for the, their children to come and visit them. Sometimes the parents will come to Manipal and visit their children, but primarily the parents are busy with their activities, the work that they do, earning their money. So most of the time the students are leaving Udupi to get on a train, to go to Mumbai or to go to Delhi or to go to where, outside wherever you, your family is and you meet with them for two weeks or three weeks and then they come back. So, uh, so this situation is that, uh, that there's things happening in a, in a university like Manipal University where the parents are not aware they don't know that children, their children are taking drugs. They don't know, the parents don't know that the children are going to these bars at night, Friday night, Saturday night. They go to some pub or whatever you call it, some place like that. And not only the boys are drinking alcohol, the young girls are drinking alcohol. 18, 19, 20 years old, young people. And even they get intoxicated sometimes. Some are falling on the ground. I've never been into one of those places, but all the young men, all the bhaktas, the devotees in Manipal University, we have a nice program there also for working with the Manipal students. So they were telling me many times, yeah, they, they fall on the ground drunk, they're throwing up, they go home and they go to the, into the bathroom and then they, they sit down they're so drunk, they sit down and they just kind of put their arms around the toilet and they barf and it comes in the toilet because they're so completely intoxicated. So the parents don't know what's happening. But we are, this whole process that we have going on here, the temple, this place, I think another arrangement is being made in some nearby place for similar program like I see here. So the idea is that the purpose of life is to awaken our love for Krishna. Those who don't want to give any affection to Krishna, they want to ignore Krishna. I'm talking about people living now in India who don't have any spiritual thoughts. They just have materialistic plans. They don't have any spiritual mm, aspirations to love the Lord. So uh, we, are, we are arranging these programs like this so that we can all awaken our feelings of affection for Krishna. And those who don't show any affection, then they'll have to take birth repeatedly until the love awakens in the heart. Love means, in Sanskrit, it's called prem. It also means priti. Priti means love. Priti and prem, similar, means love. So, in chapter 10, text 10, Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, Krishna says, I will give you the understanding how you can come back to me. Krishna says, come back to me. Because we have turned away from Krishna. We are here in this world of what? Birth, death, old age and disease. Janma mrityu jaravyadi dukkha dosha nu darshanam. What does darshanam mean? To see. So dukkha dosha nu darshanam means you have to, you have to see the suffering, duk means suffering. You have to see the suffering of birth, death, old age and disease. We have to see that. We have to realize that in this material world all of these bodies are temporarily manifest and soon they will no longer be visible. These bodies will fall on the ground if you don't perform some kind of ceremony at the time of death of this person who the body is laying on the ground, then they will have to take a birth in the next life and in the next life and in the next life. In Bhagavad Gita chapter 7, Lord Krishna was telling Arjuna, 
बाहु नाम जन्म नामांत है बाहु नाम जन्म वट डज दैट मीन बाहु नाम जन्म हु कैन से बाहु नाम जन्म जन्म मींस बर्थ एंड बाहु मींस मेनी मेनी बाहु नाम जन्म नाम अंत है सो कृष्ण से आफ्टर मेनी बर्थ्स एंड डेथ्स अंत है मींस डेथ so after many births and death one becomes gyanavan he becomes filled with spiritual knowledge so mam to pajjante krishna will bless him and take him back to the spiritual world so i wanted to just use one page here the, of a lecture that prabhupad gave prabhu ji um going to ask him to uh, translate i'll try i'll just read it a little slow is it okay is it i think a few of the of the students here um, may not know all of the hindi that some of you do so he'll be able to translate so it's just one page so prabhupad was saying here we are all part and parcel of krishna prabhu says the example i have given many times Prabhupada says, just like the finger is part and parcel of my body, so the finger is always happy when it is attached to the body. Finger is happy. Prabhupada says, that is very practical. The finger is attached to the body, so that is a good thing. So Prabhupada said, try to understand. If the finger is cut, means Prabhupada means when he says the finger is cut, means the finger is cut off. This finger, you can say, cut off. If the finger is cut and separated from the body, everyone will see that the finger is falling on the ground, is laying on the ground. Finger is laying there on the ground. Finger is separated completely from the hand and the body. So Prabhupada says, the finger has value only so long as it is attached with the body. The finger needs to be attached to the body in order for it to have any value. Thank you. As soon as the finger is separated from the body, then what? It becomes useless. It becomes useless. As soon, I had my my finger got cut one time. I was building a, an asan like this, a singhasan, similar to this, not exactly, but similar. I had a small business, and I was making these singhasans for. the devotees who wanted to have some nice wooden uh, place to put, nice thing to place in their home so i was using a flat table and i was pushing a piece of wood and everything was going fine and then i just needed to move this little extra piece that i cut off so i went with like this just to move this other piece and accidentally i stuck my my thumb in that saw it was going very fast and it cut off about that much of the tip of my can you see little short so it's a little short because it got cut off so prabhupad is saying here that uh that the finger has value so long it's attached with the body as soon as it's separated it's useless So Prabhu says so in human society the central point of existence is Krishna. Krishna is the center of all existence. And he says all living entities have an eternal relationship with Krishna. All 
living beings, all jivatmas, all of them have an eternal relationship with Krishna. Each of us have an eternal relationship with Krishna. Each jiva has an eternal relationship with Krishna. Just imagine if you try to walk around the outer edge of India all the way down and down to south, the south India and down to the very tip and then you come around this side where the you come close to the Bay of Bengal and then that, that same uh, ocean is there but this is called the uh, uh, Indian Ocean the other one is called the Arabian Sea so that Indian Ocean goes like this right over to the edge of where this uh, uh, other country, next country to India is, some second country is there. So imagine trying to count all the little teeny grains of sand all along the whole side of India, this side all the way there. Who can count like that? There's so many, so many pieces of sand, isn't it? So many. Who can count? But just imagine how many jivatmas there are, how many living beings there are. There's unlimited. There's no question of counting them. The jivas are unlimited living beings. But now all the jivatmas are here in this material world and everyone on some level or the other is suffering due to this process of taking birth and the body falling on the ground no longer useful and then again taking another birth. So this birth and death is going on in this material world. So Prabhupada says, we all have a relationship with Krishna. Then Prabhupada says, but if by your intelligence you cannot find out with whom you are intimately related with, then what is the value of your intelligence? Prabhupada is saying that you must have some reasonable amount of intelligence otherwise then you will forget, you will live without any idea of having any relationship with Krishna. And Prabhupada is saying, because if you cannot find out who you're intimately related with, then what is the value of your intelligence? Prabhupada says the intelligence means the ability to analyze things in the proper perspective. That's the definition of intelligence. Just listen to it once again. Intelligence means the ability to analyze things in the proper perspective perspective. And that means if one is using his good intelligence to understand important subject matters, then that person is an elevated person and he can help himself to get out of this suffering condition. But if those jivatmas ignore ignore anything to do with Krishna, then their intelligence is of no value because they're simply living like polished cats and dogs. In, in Sanskrit, these polished cats and dogs, Prabhupada calls them dvipada pashu. What does the word pashu mean? Animal. Dvipada, what does that mean? Two-legged. The Vipada Pashu means two-legged animal. So human being who has no good intelligence, he's simply like a two-legged animal. No good brain substance. No ability to properly understand the jiva and the relationship the jiva has with Krishna. When they have no understanding of God, then they're just like animals, not like human beings. So Prabhupada says, that kind of lack of intelligence, that kind of intelligence, Prabhupada says, a dog has got. Prabhupada is saying, even a dog has more intelligence than some of these human beings. So he says, the dog knows how to eat, sleep, mate and defend. We all know. Eat, sleep, mate and defend. But 
humans also know how to eat, sleep, and mate and defend, right? They're all doing the same thing. They eat something, they, they sleep some time, period of time, they mate, and then they protect themselves. So Prabhupada is saying like that, that, that we have to use our intelligence properly and even the animal, Prabhupada says, he knows how to do these things. Eat, sleep, mate, and defend, he knows. So Prabhupada says, so this is the Krishna Conscious Movement. We're trying to utilize our intelligence to find out the supreme cause of all causes. We're trying to use our brain substance to understand God and how we are related to Him. We should be interested in that. Human beings should be interested in how they are related to Krishna. How they are a relative of Krishna. Because every Jivatma is a part and parcel of Krishna. We all belong to Krishna. That means we are parts and parcel of Krishna. So Prabhupada is saying like that. We're trying to utilize our intelligence to find out the supreme cause of causes with whom we are intimately related. Many people have no conception that they're related at all to Krishna. But we know that because we're studying Bhagavad Gita and we're chanting Hare Krishna. So Prabhupada says, because, oh, he says, with whom we're intimately related. Then he says, we are now separated from Krishna. We have forgotten Krishna. This is our current position. So Prabhupada is making this point. We're separated from Krishna now, means many jivatmas, we're talking on the human level, many human beings have no interest, they don't have any thought, they're not making any inquiry into how they are connected with Krishna. So Prabhupada is saying, so we have all come to this world and we have forgotten Krishna. This is our unfortunate position. So Prabhupada says, so our intelligence must be utilizing, utilized for searching out the Supreme Lord and reestablishing our relationship with Him. So Prabhupada is making very simple points. He's just saying that we have the opportunity now to use our intelligence and realize and understand and reestablish real, real, uh, re our relationship with Krishna. Then Prabhupada says, give, he gives an example here, simple example Prabhupada gives. Just like if long ago you lost your father, means father passed away. Long time back your father no more. Body is finished, body was burnt on some funeral pyre and now you have no father. So he's saying, just like if long ago you lost your father, if you somehow find out your father, immediately your relationship with him is revived. So, if some father goes away, the son doesn't know anything, where the father has been, he has no idea how to find him. But if the father comes back, then Prabhupada is making the point that we should, he says, if long ago the, you lost your father, lost your father means there was some separation between the son and the father. So Prabhupada says then, if you somehow can find out your father, then immediately your relationship with him is corrected. It is revived. Now the loving feeling between the son and the father, that has uh, regained the, the, the feelings of affection for one another because they, some effort was made to keep the family uh, together. So Prabhupada is saying like that. He says, you will say, Prabhupada is saying now, when the, when the son finds out my, son, my father has just come back, then this, the son will say, oh, here is my father. And the father will say, oh, here is my son. Prabhupada says, because the relationship is very intimate. So on a family member basis, it is intimate. Generally, it's an intimate relationship between parent and child. So Prabhupada is saying like that. So then he's saying, a son may go out for many years, but as soon as he comes back home, he sees his father, and that original intimacy is immediately revived. 
So sometimes it's the sun that leaves. Sometimes the sun runs away from home. Sometimes the sun doesn't like whatever, something he doesn't like about the family situation he's in. So he will quietly leave. And the parents don't have any idea where they are. One time I left. I was in Texas, in the United States. I was born in USA. So I, at age about 19 or 20, I was working at some steel company, young man. And I, without telling my mother or father, I just left. I was gone for six months. They, had no, they thought I was dead. Because in six months they never heard. I never called them. I didn't have any contact with them. I didn't write any letter to them. I just left. At that time I was a fairly foolish young man. I was smoking marijuana. I was doing some stupid things. So I just left and didn't give any contact information to them where I was going. So they were all bewildered. Oh, where, where is my son? Why he's gone? Why we don't hear anything from him? So, so Prabhupada said like that. A son may go out for a long time, but as soon as he comes back and sees the father, then the relationship is connected again. Then there's also some loving feelings between the son and the father. So Prabhupada says, so when we come to that position to understand our intimate relationship with Krishna, that is called Svarup City. So Prabhupada is saying, at that point, this Svarup City, this, uh, this loving feelings, realization of the loving feeling toward Krishna, that is called Svarup City. So Prabhupada says, so our relationship with Krishna is natural. Actually, it is true. We are naturally connected with Krishna. We are naturally related to Krishna. Because Krishna is the Supreme Person and we are His children. Aham bija pradapita. Pita means father. Aham means I am. Krishna says aham bija. Bija means seed giving father. Aham bija pradapita. Prada means the living beings. So we are all part and parcel of Krishna. So Prabhupada says like that, that our relationship with Krishna is natural. Simply, it is covered. So Prabhupada said, our relationship with Krishna is natural, but right now our relationship with Him has been covered. How has it been covered? It has been covered over by Maya. Maya has bewildered us to make us believe that there is no God, there is no person like Krishna, Krishna doesn't exist. So many things Maya is trying to do to bewilder the jiva souls. So here it is saying, Prabhupada says that our relationship with Krishna is natural and it's true. We have a natural relationship with Krishna, but right now that relationship has been cut off. It has been covered. So he says that covering has to be taken away. Just like if someone were hiding behind a curtain. You couldn't see their feet. You couldn't see anything was behind there. You thought, oh, just some curtain is hanging. But there could be someone behind there. You open it up and, oh, someone is standing behind the curtain. So Prabhupada is saying like that. The covering has to be taken away. So when we turn away from Krishna, we don't think of Him. We simply think of our own material enjoyment. We think of our own plans. We have our own ideas. We don't want to have any conversation at all with Krishna or anyone that's interested with Krishna. We just want to have our own life to live in this world. So that's an unfortunate situation because without Krishna, we are going to remain in this material world and suffer life after life. So Prabhupada says, so that covering has to be taken away. Then we are intimately in relationship with Krishna. That is the perfection of Krishna consciousness. So it's a very simple statement that Prabhupada was telling. This lecture, as I said, was in 1973. This is when I joined, actually. December 6th, 1973. I was 23 years old at that time. I had a small house that I was purchasing. I had about a half an acre of land. I had a small business. I was good using my hands to make things and sell them. So as that young man, I was, I was active in getting things accomplished. But 
It wasn't until I met some devotees, they, they passed out some books, I gave some donation, and at first I couldn't read them. I tried to read some of these small paperback books, like uh, Perfection of Yoga, so many names are there, these small books, small print books. I tried to read them, but I, wa I wasn't able to. I, wrote, uh, I read two or three pages, and I just um, couldn't quite understand what they were saying. It was a little, little foreign to me. I had not re read those kind of books before. So I just put it on the shelf. And a little while later, I was becoming more interested again in God. I was a Christian. I started out as a Christian. Uh, my family, were their, their religious belief was the Christian belief, so I went to church with them. And then after I became a more of a teenager, I started doing some stupid things, disintoxication, things like that. So then I got rid of that idea. I, I was tired of taking drugs and tired of chasing these ladies and abusing them. So I started praying to Jesus. Jesus is known to be the Son of God. But I couldn't find out in the Bible who that, that Supreme Lord was. Jesus was saying, My, Our Father who art in heaven. So Jesus was praying to some higher being. But I couldn't figure out who Jesus was actually talking to. And I couldn't find any actual name. Other than Heavenly Father, I couldn't find any specific name. Who is that that Jesus is praying to? So I went to a friend's house. And uh, we know each other quite well. So he, and I knew he had a lot of books. He had some bookshelves, and I recall that he had plenty of books in his house. So I went over, knocked on his door, and went inside. I said, I want to look at some of your books. So I was looking around, and I found one book. It said, Bhagavad Gita as it is. I, said, I took the book off the shelf. I looked at it front and back, and I asked my friend Jack. I said, what is this? This is in Bhagavad Gita as it is. What is that? He said, well, it's like an Indian Bible. That's what, it's the only answer he knew. He said, it's an Indian Bible. I said, really? i never been to India. That would be interesting. Let me read that. So I said, I'm going to borrow this book. I'll bring it back. I told him, I'll bring it back. So I took the book home. I closed my business. I locked it. I had some shop and I was building something. So I locked it up. And that very day, I started reading this Bhagavad Gita as it is. I started with the very first page. I didn't jump in the middle. I went to the beginning. I read the whole introduction. I read all the way through. In three days, I read all 900 pages of Bhagavad Gita as it is. I don't think I even ate. I think maybe just drank some water. I don't know. But I, I was very eager to read this fascinating Bible from India. I thought that's still kind of weird. <laughs> but, uh, but I read the whole book in three days. Top, top to bottom, from the beginning to the end. And then I realized, okay, Jesus is not God. Jesus is the Son of God. And the Father of Jesus is Krishna. I said, now I put the puzzle together. Now I know Krishna is God. I was so happy. And you know, even when I first got the book, I was looking and I saw, okay, this guy's blue. His face is blue. I'm going to read it anyway. It's a little weird to have a blue face, but I'm going to read it anyway. So I read the whole Bhagavad Gita and I was amazed. So at the end of the finishing the book, the end of that day, third day finished, whole book finished, read. So I looked in the back because I wanted to find out where I could meet this Bhaktivedanta Swami this person on the wall. I, I wanted to meet him because I could realize he was a very, very, very spiritual person. He knew so many amazing things. Uh, even though I tried to read the Bible, they were nothing compared to the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad, the Bhagavad Gita had so much more information that was so valuable. So I was very happy. So I was looking in the back of the book for some, see if I can find some addresses or phone numbers where I can go to some temple and meet this Bhaktivedanta Swami. So I made one phone call and they said, uh, well, he's not here, but he's in Los Angeles, California, down in the south. So make a call there. So I got on the phone and called and the phone rang. It was one, one devotee. And I said, hello, 
Hare Krishna, I just read this book, Bhagavad Gita as it is, and I want to meet this Bhaktivedanta Swami. Do you know, is he there at the temple? And the devotee said, yes, he's here. He'll be here for the next few days. I said, okay, uh, don't let him go. I'm coming. I'll be there very soon. <laughs> so I jumped in my car. This is at night I'm making this phone call. I jumped in the car and I drove six or seven hours. And then by the time I got all the way down to Los Angeles, it was about four or five in the morning. I think I just, you know, slept in my car a little bit until daylight came. And then I started walking around the temple. There are plenty of devotees. There are many of them. Most of them all look like Narada Muni. You know, they have some, you know, they have some saffron cloth and they have some funny looking shika in the back and this is all cut off, so. But I was not looking like that. My hair was this long, like this. I'm sorry, it was like a woman's hair, very long hair. And uh, I had big beard also. At that time, we were all known to be hippies. So I was number one hippie also, you know. <laughs> Means a foolish man, some foolish man. So, still, and I had very baggy pants. It wasn't like blue jeans or anything like that. It was very baggy, kind of yogi pants, some kind of whatever you could call. I looked like I came really from the forest somewhere. So, so I got out of the car and I was walking around and I, I met one person, one devotee. His name was Jivananda. And I told him, I said, I, I don't know, I just arrived. I just read Bhagavad Gita. I want to meet this Bhaktivedanta Swami. He said, yes, no problem. You come and stay with me. He had a wife and two, three children. You can stay. He said, you can stay in my flat and you can go to the classes for several days. And so I did. I stayed in his home. Then I would go in the morning for, for the classes. I would listen to Prabhupada speak and I was meeting many of the brahmacharis and I was feeling a little awkward because they all look like Narada Muni and I had all these long hairs coming down. So, but I didn't want to cut it. I was very attached. So I just took the hairs in the back and I twisted it as much as I could twist it and I put it down the back of my shirt all the way down like that. So they couldn't really see really too much because I stuffed it down in my shirt. But still I had this, you know, big bushy beard. So I listened to the whole class um, and I thought, I thought Prabhupada was speaking to me because after about 15-20 minutes of the class, there was one person sitting more or less in front of me but a little bit to the side, to the right. I was kind of behind him but over this way and he was a little to the right in front of me and Prabhupada was here. So I was diligently looking at Prabhupada, I was listening. I could understand most of what he said. Sometimes his accent was a little difficult for me to understand each word but most of it I could understand. So I was very peacefully sitting there like, like everyone else sitting on the floor and all of a sudden I heard this, sit properly. Prabhupada was sitting on the Vyasa sign and he was looking toward, I thought he was looking toward me. I was thinking, oh, I'm already in trouble. I just got here today. So he said, sit properly. And I was thinking, what's going to happen now? And then this person sitting in front of me to the right, I figured out what was doing. He, ha he was sitting, his butt was sitting on the floor and his knees were up and he was holding his legs like this on the floor. And, and luckily, my legs were properly laying on the floor nicely. But he was holding his legs up and Prabhupada doesn't like that. He likes all of his uh, followers to cross their legs and let them sit on the floor, flat on the floor. So this person started squirming around to try to get his feet in the proper place. And I was going, okay, I didn't get in any trouble. <laughs> so that scared me. First day there, I thought, oh my goodness. So anyway, so then the second day, third day, I was meeting so many devotees. So then I got in my little car and drove back north. I was very excited. I was wearing tilak, this devotee that let me stay. He taught me a little bit how to put on the tilak. He even gave me a little chance to do some service for Srila Prabhupada and I, I, I'd only seen him for those two or three days. But there was some special kind of... Um, Let's see, what do we call it? Ruby. He had some small ruby beads 
that they had drilled a little hole through each ruby and they ran some, some kind of stiff, like almost like a very thin uh, uh, fishing line or something. He, somebody had made these ruby neck beads for Srila Prabhupada. And it had something on the back that you could screw it together and the, those beads were, would be on Prabhupada's neck, these ruby beads. Prabhupada sometimes needed to wear these ruby beads because it had something to do with his health. When he had these ruby beads on, it was better for uh, some aspects of his bodily needs. So Prabhupada would sometimes wear those. But uh, th that string had been cut. So Jivananda, this person that let me stay there at his home, he, uh, he, he brought him over and said, you want to do this service for Prabhupada? Do you want to you wanna string these ruby beads? I said, sure. So I got, I got a chance to do that. And anyway, so I, when I got back up north, I went into my workshop. I opened it. I unlocked the, the door. I went and looked this side. I looked this side. I was looking at all of the material that I have there in my business. I closed the door. I locked it. And I said, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm finished with that. No more of that business. <laughs> and then I started calling some friends. I'd go see some friends. I said, hey, I need some electric razor, you know, some electric shaver. <laughs> and they said, why do you need that? So said, no, I just need to use it. He says, well, I don't have one. I said, okay. I asked another person. No, I, he didn't know. Three or four people, they didn't have one. Finally, I asked one person. He said, yeah, I got one. Why do you want that? I said, well, don't ask me that. Just let me borrow. I'll bring it back to you. So I, I took the razor. I, I, somehow, I had a, some mirror behind me, and I took some smoke, and I was trying to do So I was shaving all of this hairs off, and I was making sure not to cut my shika off. I wanted this really long shika. So I left this part on hanging down, and... Uh, and then I was putting on T-lock every day. Wasn't so expert in the beginning. I got a little better after that. But so then I was walking around to the bank when I had to. I had to go do still little little transaction work with the bank. So then I, I called uh, Jivananda, the one who let me stay. And and uh, so we had a really. I just was very happy to hear from him. And I said, Jivananda, I got to tell you something. I just joined this con. I'm not going to do any more of this work I had. I just want to join ISKCON. Why don't we open my house? We can make my house a temple and we can preach from there and we can go out and preach to people. So that's how my beginning came into Krishna consciousness. I started taking it very, very seriously and that was 46 years ago now. That was 1973. This is uh, 2019. So that was 46 years ago that I met Prabhupada and after seven years as a brahmachari, I was wearing saffron cloth and uh, after seven years as a brahmachari, I thought I might become a sannyasi one day because there were, there were, Prabhupada was giving sannyas initiation to some of his disciples. So I was thinking, well, maybe one day I can, maybe, let's see, I might be able to take up this sannyas ashram and I may be able to travel alone all over the world like Prabhupada is doing. I can go preaching. So I was thinking like that. And uh, all of a sudden, I don't know why Cupid seemed to have some uh, bad impression of me because you know Cupid, he has a bow and an arrow. So he started shooting me right there. Boom. Some sharp arrow in the chest. And I was like, hey, hey, looks like it's bleeding. I pulled the arrow out and then Cupid would shoot me again. I'm just telling you, not really shooting, but he was trying to get me in, you know, some bad situation. So he kept shooting arrows and I was pulling them out and he kept shooting them and I was getting all bloody and finally I had to realize, hey, I'm not going to be a sannyasi. I can't do it. This guy has knocked me off now. I can't do, I can't become a sannyasi. So now I think I have to just get married. So that was seven years ago. Now we have, uh, we have three children and the eighth grandchild is coming in uh, about four or five months, so three children and uh, it'll soon be eight grandchildren. But uh, personally, after doing some business, after I supported my family nicely, earned 
reasonable amount of money. I was a hard worker. I was pushing hard to make sure that the needs of my family were taken care of. And then after some time, I just decided I don't want to keep trying to earn more money. I had enough money to live on. I, didn't, I wasn't a millionaire, I didn't have a million dollars, but I had ample amount of money that I had saved from my business activity. So I decided to move to India 10 years ago. So the last 10 years we're traveling, my wife and I traveling all over India. She goes back from time to time to uh, see the children and grandchildren. I've done it a few times, but most of the time I just stay in India. And the plan is to continue the best we can to travel. We just took a tour from Udupi, just a short distance away to Mangaluru. We stayed for two days. We had nice kirtans. We had nice uh, preaching activities going on, nice home programs going on. Then from there we took a bus to Tamil Nadu. We went to one city called Salem. We stayed in Salem for six days. We had ecstatic kirtans there, all kinds of nice classes. We had a wonderful time there. Then we had to come home for just a few days. Then we had to take a train to go to Surat. So we stayed in Surat for five days. Wonderful time there. So many nice devotees in Surat. We had, they, had a, they, they were well-to-do, these business uh, people, devotees. They were all very nice devotees. One of them, the younger brother, had a fairly big house, maybe two, three stories tall. And the older brother was a little more well-to-do with his business, so he had even a bigger house right next door. So we had 350 devotees come to have a huge kirtan there. And then we went to many other places. So for five days we were, it was very ecstatic to be in Surat. And then from there we went to Baroda. In Baroda, we had three days in Baroda uh, by train. We're, we're doing all this by train. We don't like to fly airplane. We like to go by train. So for three days, we stayed in Baroda. That was also wonderful. Now we've just come here to Bhopal. We'll be here tomorrow and maybe something will happen on Monday. Maybe we'll do something. We need to rest a little bit, my wife and I, because we've been really busy with these kirtans and things. But, but anyway, we'll, we'll be here for a couple more days. Then we go to Delhi for some programs, and we go to five days in, in uh, uh, Brindavan Dam. From there we'll go to Pushkar in Rajasthan. From there we take a train back to Delhi, and from there down to Calcutta, and we go to Mayapur. Sridham Mayapur is a very special place, Mahaprabhu's birthplace. So we'll go there for one week. From there we'll take another train to Bengaluru in the south. We'll stay there for 10 days. So uh, at least six weeks, Davy and I will be traveling. Body is a little old, 70 years. My wife's a little bit slightly younger than, than the body I have. Hers is slightly younger. But still, at our age, we're, we're moving. And uh, my wife wasn't able to come now because she's doing some class. She's giving some classes to the ladies here in uh, Bhopal to, because the ladies are always wanting to know you know, how they can deal with their husbands and... <laughs> My wife is having to try to satisfy all these ladies. So, so I don't go in those rooms. I stay completely away from that. Let them talk. That's okay. I like to talk to you guys. That's the easiest. <laughs> I stay out of those things. My wife is always on the... She's, she's, she has these uh, strong, you know, desires to keep in touch. Always bzz, 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 you know, she, all these electronic things, she, some devices she has. I have the best one, she doesn't even like it at all. It's a 1600 rupee Nokia. Excellent phone. <laughs> Very nice telephone. Very nice. Very cheap also. You can throw it on the ground, it will not break. <laughs> you can throw it in the ocean, that's no problem. You just take it apart, dry it a little bit, put it in the sun, pick it up, and I can start calling again. <laughs> Very powerful. So I don't fool with all these WhatsApp. This WhatsApp, I don't care at all about WhatsApp. You all have WhatsApp? So, so many of you probably do. I have no WhatsApp. I'm not going to get a WhatsApp. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't, I don't want to deal with that. So anyway, so it's a blissful life. I'm sitting here smiling with all you guys because Krishna consciousness is a happy life. It's a blissful life, very blissful life. Who wouldn't like to eat prasadam every day, three times a day? That's a really nice thing. <laughs> we all like prasadam. Everybody loves prasadam. So, that's the, if nothing else, at least come for that, right? I had a friend, his name was Arjun. I had a friend named Arjun. He was, in, he just went to Manipal University. This is seven, eight years ago, nine years ago. So I, I just started to get to know him. But uh, before I even knew him, I found out about him. He was in his first year of study in Manipal University. And someone told him, met him, and they were chatting. And this fellow said, hey, you know what? I was going to tell you something. I heard about, if you go over to Syndicate Circle, there's some place nearby. And there's a house there, kind of a big yard in a, in a house. He, he, said, uh, he said, why don't you go over to that place near Syndicate Circle, it's called Bhajan Kutir, go and knock on the door and ask them, I think there's some of these Hare Krishna people, you know, they have some orange clothes and all that. Go knock on the door and uh, see what you can find out. Maybe, maybe you can go and visit there. So he thought, well, maybe I'll try, maybe I'll go and see. So he went after some days, he walked down that way, he went and he knocked on the door, door opened up. And there was one devotee, Tilak, and he had his cloth on, nice cloth on, saffron cloth. So they had a little chat. And Arjun would say, so if, if I come, what will, what will happen? He says, well, if you come on Saturday nights, then you just come and sit down and we'll have kirtan. We'll have nice kirtan. We'll chant Hare Krishna for a half an hour, 45 minutes. And then you can sit peacefully also, and someone will give a class. Usually they'll give some class on Bhagavad Gita. And he says, okay, what is Bhagavad Gita? And that man said something, little, told him a little something, what is Bhagavad Gita? And then he said, uh, and then he said, and after that, the third thing that we do is we have RT. So just like all of you, you, have, you do some RT ceremony. So, so they have the same situation like we have right here. So he said, yeah, we'll have an RT ceremony. They'll, they'll offer some ghee lamps and incense and chamaras and all of these nice worship to the Lord. And, uh, and uh, Arjun said, okay, is that everything? He says, no, after that RT, then there is prasadam. We have really nice prasadam after the arti ceremony. And you can come and, and, and uh, take part in that. You can have a meal with us of prasadam. He said, okay, let me think about it. So he left. And then next week he came. Uh, he didn't come uh, when, he, when he got there. It was too late for the uh, kirtan. It was too late for the class. It was too late for the uh, um, worship, the RT, but it was not too late for the prasadam. So, so he had his first prasadam. At the end of the day, he, he skipped everything else and waited. Maybe he stood out there waiting until the RT ceremony was over ringing. I don't know what he did, but he waited until the last minute. Then he went inside. They fed him nicely. So what happened was from that day, for two years later, he never, in two years, he never missed coming to the Bhajan Kutir. But every time he came, it was only coming for prasadam. <laughs> so uh, 52, 52 weeks, the, 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 there's a, uh, there's every week he would go there and I think it's 52 weeks I think if you do the math it's about 52 weeks so that was a what is that a hundred and four times he went there but he never did any of the other stuff but somehow he got enthusiastic and he took up Krishna consciousness now he's a very nice devotee he is now he, he's married he has a nice child nice son so Anyway, we, we all have this opportunity now to go back to Godhead. We just have to decide. Do we want to stay here and suffer uh, old age, uh, death, rebirth, um, uh, get in, get, you end up in the, some pig body? Who wants to take birth in a pig body? Raise your hand. Pig body, next life. You want to? No, no one wants. No one wants. 
So, anyway, so our opportunities are here. Our op opportunities are in a situation like this. Everything has been nicely arranged, and if we just sincerely take this up in a nice way, then we'll benefit and we'll all have a chance to seriously take up this loving feelings for Krishna and we may be able to go back to Godhead even in this lifetime. It is a possibility for all of us. Nothing is stopping us. We just have to be, uh, three things we have to do. Utsahan nischaya darya. These three words. Utsahan means we have to be enthusiastic. Utsahan nischaya means we have to be uh, not patient, we have to be determined. And the third one is we have to be utsahan nisya darya. Darya means patient. Patience. We have to have patience. So we have to be enthusiastic, we have to be determined, determined, and we also have to be patient. So if we take care of these three things in Krishna consciousness, then we'll make a lot of progress. And the potential is there that we can finish our life in this material world and return to the spiritual world. We all were very nicely living in the spiritual world, but somehow or another we got this wild idea in our mind that we could enjoy independently. So the jiva, when he thinks like that, Krishna sends him into the material world and Krishna lets him stay. Let's him stay as long as he wants. Let's him act in any way he likes. Krishna is not forcing anything. Love is voluntary. Love is voluntary. There's no meaning of love unless the love is voluntary. When there's voluntary love, then that's meaningful love. So we're trying to awaken our love for Krishna. And when our love for Krishna awakens within our heart, then we will realize that we belong in only one place. We only belong in the spiritual world. We will never come back. Once one goes back to the spiritual world, the jiva will never return to this world of birth and death. It will never happen. So we are fortunate. Let us take advantage. So I'm going to stop with that in mind. I hope in some of this had any meaningful thought to you. And uh, I'm glad to meet some of you who will be coming uh, from time to time here to Bhopal. I think this is our third visit here. I know you all, I know what happens, you all finish your education and you move out and some new ones all move in. I know that whole routine because we did that in Udupi a lot. But it was nice to meet you. So Prabhuji, what's, what should we do now? We've had a little chat with these nice fellows, so uh, something. Hmm. Yeah, you have a question? Yes. Okay. Is it a hard question or an easy question? <laughs> if, it's an, if it's an easy question, I'll answer. If it's a hard question, I'll let Prabhuji answer that. <laughs> so what? Why God give us self-intelligence? Why God give? Self-intelligence. Self-intelligence. Because of this, uh, I asked this question because of self-intelligence, we are here in the, this material world. So this is not good thing for us. Yeah, well, um, there are five punch boot. There are five things. There is, earth, there is earth, water, fire, air, and space. So those elements are material elements. Have you heard of those? Panch Bhuta? Yeah, earth, water, fire, air, and space. And then there is material mind, material intelligence, and ahankara, false ego. So those three things, mind, intelligence, and false ego, those are material. The mind, and the material mind, when one is not fully Krishna conscious, his mind is having materialistic thoughts. And when one is not fully uh, intelligent in Krishna consciousness, then he also has some problems using his intelligence properly. And then for the false ego, that false ego means I want to still be the enjoyer. So when one thinks that he is or should be the enjoyer. So that is also a strike against 
uh, that living being. He's not going to make that much progress. So what we really need is that we need to keep ourselves in the association of highly advanced Krishna conscious devotees or whether we're in direct contact with them or whether we're reading Prabhupada's books Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, all of these base, very nice books that we have. If we take advantage of uh, what we hear then our intelligence will clear up because Prabhupada said the definition of intelligence is, uh, Prabhupada said, intelligence means, let's see how Prabhupada was stating that. We have to understand things in the proper perspective. Prabhupada says to get the intelligence properly set up, we have to utilize uh, our intelligence in such a way that we are properly in the right situation. How is it Prabhupada says, I want, Prabhupada says, yeah, we, should. we should understand things in the proper perspective. Perspective means vision, vision, seeing. So we have to see properly uh, uh, how the intelligence is acting. So the mind sometimes is your, either your best friend or it can also be your worst enemy. The mind can pull you away from uh, things that can, if you, you want to be Krishna conscious, sometimes there will be big kirtan. Devotees uh, may join the kirtan. Everyone's dancing very enthusiastically in the kirtans. This, like I told you, 350 devotees came in uh, Surat. So there were, there were large group, big kirtan, very ecstatic. And, but no, Maya doesn't really trouble anyone. So generally Maya won't cause any trouble when the kirtan is going on. Especially when devotees are dancing and you know, they're, they're smiling ear to ear. The, the, the kirtan is tasting very sweet. So everyone is very happy. Maya is not really causing any trouble. So she just kind of sits in the corner. But after the program is over and people start walking, maybe they don't have a car, maybe they start walking home, uh, then who knows what will happen. When, the, when everyone is together, joined together chanting Hare Krishna, we're very happy to be together. But when we leave, our mind starts thinking about this or wondering about this or speculating about that. And then Maya, starts sitting on the shoulder and starts talking to him in his ear, some nonsense, and then he gets himself in trouble. Maya starts giving him some crazy ideas. So we have to understand things in the proper perspective by using good intelligence. So the better we uh, hone our intelligence by studying, you can study about Krishna Conscious Intelligence. You can look it up in database. You can find some very nice topics about that. So give that a little effort and then maybe in the future we can discuss some more. Good question though. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Anyone? Yes, Mabuji. Yes, uh, the way you said that when we are in Kirtan, then Maya doesn't disturb us. But Gen generally not. Yeah, but when, when we are chanting, like when that is also Kirtan, but then we just just uh, say the Lord's name while they're chanting. So then why does that Maya disturb? Why like Maya is going here, there, you have to do this, that? Well, yeah, that's a very good point. A, a good question that you're asking. Very good question. So, nowadays, in the past, in the past, I was in India, the first time I came was in 1977. And I saw, there were plenty of dogs. Whenever you're in India, you can walk around the city streets or in the villages. There's plenty of dogs. But the dogs are not inside the house. In the past, the dogs were never let inside the house. It was just culture. You don't let some dog come inside. The, the, the dog stays outside and they throw some food outside that's left over. Then the dog will eat that outside. But they generally didn't put, let a dog come inside. So, so uh, what happens sometimes now, 
people are maybe they're more wealthy maybe they worked really hard maybe they all got really good jobs but I see now in India that was 1977 so 87 97 107 so 40 something years ago so 40 years 40 years from then means around this time now you see the Indians they're walking around with a, uh, some dog and a leash and they're holding holding on and there's some leash and it's hooked to the collar. They put a collar around the dog and they, they make some little something that holds holds the uh, leash to the collar and so they want to train this new dog because they just went and bought this new dog, this puppy dog, young, young puppy dog. So they, the, the person wants to train the dog to walk straight. So the first time he takes the dog and picks him up and walks out on the sidewalk, he puts the dog on the ground, he has this leash and uh, the collar is there. There's, there's some maybe eight or ten feet of this leash. So he, he's hoping that this dog will just walk right next to him. So the man starts walking and he gives a little pull. And the dog, little puppy, takes two or three steps. And what does he do? He just starts running over this side. And so the guy has the, you know, he still has this uh, leash. So he pulls that leash and drags the puppy next to him. And then he, he makes some kind of sound. He says some word or something. He's trying to train this dog. So he says some word to that dog. Then the man starts walking and he pulls the leash a little. So the puppy will walk two or three steps and then he'll walk this, run this way. So the dog will run like this. He'll run like that. He'll run behind you. He'll, you know, he'll, he'll just do all kinds of crazy things. So it takes some time to be able to uh, make some positive uh, influence upon the dog. After the dog has enough training, enough times walking out with the so-called master, so finally the dog learns to just walk right next to the person who bought it. So once we get settled down with Krishna consciousness, once we've heard enough, once we keep hearing we keep understanding, we keep reading, we keep uh, learning, then Maya doesn't really have much chance at that point. It's just when the, when the, you know, the, the mind is going this way and going that way, that's when we get a little bewildered. That's when Maya whispers so many stupid things in our ear. So, just like these puppy dogs are wild until they get trained, we have to train the mind. Mana eva manushanam karanam banda mokshaya. Man mana. So, so this mind, it's either going to be your best friend or the worst enemy. That is found in Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter. So, so we need to understand that the mind is frivolous. The mind can be frivolous. It may just want to do whatever it wants to do. So we have to have the intelligence because the intelligence is above the mind. Just like you were asking about intelligence. So the, in, the intelligence is, has the potential to be more beneficial to us than the mind because the mind has a, a ten tendency to do its own thing to go here and go there independently. So, so the intelligence has to be there to control the mind. Just like if you've seen in the Bhagavad Gita, the five horses that the Pandavas had, and it shows, it shows the uh, uh, Krishna was holding the reins to these horses. So this uh, mind, intelligence, and the ego those things have to be dealt with. So the mind can be your best friend or the mind can be your very worst enemy. So somehow we have to practice fixing our mind on Krishna's holy name, fixing our mind on serving in the temple, fix our mind on going out and speaking to people who need to hear about loving Krishna. So if we, if we properly uh, have the intelligence working nicely, then the mind will be under, more under the control of the intelligence, and so the mind won't give you so much difficulty. Is it okay? Yeah, you just keep trying. 
Your, your mind may sometimes, I have had many, many times, because I've chanted for 46 years. Sometimes I'm chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. And generally I, I try sincerely to hear what I'm saying, but uh, once in a while something just will pop into my mind and I'm still saying Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, but, I don't, but I'm thinking of something completely different. Has that ever happened to you? Many times. Many times. Anybody else has had that happen? Of course. Of course. Because the mind just wanders away. Just like what? Like the puppy dog wanders away. So we need to pull the mind back. Just like the man pulls the puppy dog back, you have to pull your mind back. So in that way, the more we train ourselves to pull our mind and fix it on the sound vibration. We're not meant to, in Japa, we're not meant to picture Krishna in our mind. We're not meant to, to visualize in our mind what Radha and Krishna look like in Goloka Vrindavan. That is not our, our business is to chant and hear the holy name. That is what we're doing. We're chanting God's holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's what we have to do is go on chanting the name. And when the mind runs, runs like the puppy dog out, out of bounds, going this way and that, then for sometimes for it may be a, a, a few seconds, it, for me it sometimes has been a, a few seconds or a, maybe, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, all of a sudden I realize, hey, I'm chanting Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but I'm really thinking about these last few 15 minutes that was on, something was on my mind and my mind just drug me away. Even though I was vibrating, I wasn't hearing Hare Krishna. It was just coming out of my mouth and the holy name was forgotten. I was just thinking of something else. So we just have to pull the mind back. It's, it's work. It's definitely some work to that, but we have to keep making a big effort. Good question. Thank you. Someone else? Prabhu? Yes? It's almost the same question. It's about the uh, free will that we have. Free will. Uh, yeah, uh, that uh, even though uh, we try hard to practice the bhakti, but uh, there are, uh, but uh, it happens many times that uh, when uh, there are hard times, we start doubting that Krishna, are you really there? Are you really uh, there to help us? Mm. You help your uh, deity, uh, you help your devotees in their difficult times. So if you are there, why am I facing such situations or such circumstances? So how to be... Uh, how to fix your mind on what you, you want to fix your mind on Krishna. Is it correct? You want to? Yeah. You have some desire to, to think of Krishna and, and you have some hope to love Krishna, some things like that, some levels of... How do I have some belief that uh, yes, you really exist, you are there to help me? Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> uh, if you look through the books, of course, you have seen everything, I'm sure, in all these books. I see here, all the Bhagavatams are there and all these things. So, by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and by the mercy of his disciples, all of these beautiful books were printed. If one reads the Vedic literatures that were written by Veda Vyasadeva, some more than 5,000 years ago, so he presented in, in uh, written form these Shastras. So the more we study Bhagavad Gita, the more we study the Bhagavatam and the Chaitanya Charitamrita, these doubts about Krishna, they slowly but surely, they, they go away. Even Arjun, if you think about Arjun, in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjun had asked Krishna to draw the chariot into the middle of the battlefield. He wanted Krishna to put it in the center so that he could, he could be, he, Krishna and Arjun could be on the chariot and Arjun wanted the chariot to be facing the Kauravas because Arjun wanted to see who was on the side of the Kauravas. 
One person that was very dear to him was Bhishma Dev, because that is the grandfather. He's grandfather of Arjun. And uh, Dronacharya was his, also his guru, because Dronacharya, he was a Brahmana, but he taught Arjun all the martial arts. So Arjun was bewildered. How can I kill my grandfather? How can I possibly do that? How can I kill my guru who taught me all these martial arts? So he was quite bewildered. And he said to Krishna, O Govinda, I shall not fight. And he threw the Gandiva bow on the ground. Right? So his mind was also unclear. Wasn't, wasn't Arjun's mind very unclear at that point? Because he's saying, I can't do it. I cannot kill my grandfather. These are family members. Why shall I kill them? Uh, even if they mistreated me. We know that 99 of the sons of Dhritarashtra tried to kill the five Pandavas. They tried in so many ways to kill the Pandavas. So, in that way, uh, Arjun himself, on the battlefield, was temporarily bewildered what to do. So at the end, at the final, last portion of the Bhagavad Gita, what is the, do you know the last chapter number? Do you know the last chapter? There's a certain number of chapters in Bhagavad Gita. 18. There's 18 chapters. So uh, Krishna asked Arjuna, okay, so now, what are you thinking? What is your idea now? Because they had spoke back, they had spoken back and forth probably an hour and a half. I'm just guessing. But it could have been an hour and a half of time. They spent discussing all of this, uh, this situation of the battle of Kurukshetra. They didn't really, they didn't, they just had, Arjun had to get things all sorted out properly in his mind. So when Krishna told him, uh, so tell me, now what is your decision? So Arjun said, well, all my doubts are now dispelled. And I am now, uh, my, my intelligence has come back clear to me. My doubts have been gone. And I am now ready to act according to your instruction. So the last three words of uh, Arjun, the last three words Arjun spoke in the Bhagavad Gita was Karishye Vachanam Tava. You know that. Karishye Vachanam Tava. Those are the last three words spoken by Arjun. Arjun said, I am now ready to act according to your instruction. So that means his doubts, his uh, uh, concern about all these things, all of that had lifted from his mind because Krishna has cleared Arjun's mind properly. His mind became clear. Once the mind was clear, he reached back with his right arm to pull out an arrow from the quiver. And he's holding the Gandiva bow like this. We've all seen on the chariot. Everyone has seen. He's standing there and he's just ready to pull the arrow out and lay on the on here and pull it, draw it back and let go and kill Bhishma and kill Dronacharya. So that, how we get that is by, he got it by hearing from Krishna. If you want to fix any issues that you have now, any questions that you have, you have to hear more from Krishna. You need to read Bhagavad Gita as much as you reasonably can. It might be two or three or four slokas a day. It can be one sloka. Whatever you have to do to do, try to read these words between Arjuna and Krishna. They're very, very, very <coughs> powerful words. And by doing that, slowly but surely, you'll find that your mind becomes clear. Right now, sometimes maybe the mind is a little questioning, like you were more or less saying, sometimes you question what about this, what about that. So that's not uncommon at all. It's not. It's a, it's a common thing. So how to fix that issue of the mind wandering here and wandering there and not sure what to do. Is this real? Does Krishna really exist? But absolutely sure. There is no question whatsoever. Krishna is the original person. Govindam Adipush 
Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. Krishna is the uh, um, the original Adi Purusha. He's the original person. So since Krishna is the original person, we should believe Krishna's words. And Arjun came to believe Krishna's words. At first he was doubtful. Eventually all the doubts and uh, the other things that were giving him turbulence in his mind, all of those became removed. And then he said, now I'm ready. Now I understand. Krishna wants the rest of these uh, warriors on the battlefield to be killed. So he draws his bow and he's ready to fight. So like that, you, you, you study Bhagavad Gita more, it'll become deeper and deeper and deeper. And then one day you'll be teaching other people all these things. You just have to get a little deep into it, okay? Very good question though, very practical. Okay? <clears throat>